Okay, I made a, a few sample questions regarding energy mass equivalence, better known as E equals mc squared, and the standard model of particle physics, some of the things that uh, people traditionally um, struggle with. So I first um, had a uh, little blurb here about how much energy you get from E equals mc squared. It's a lot. Um, but number one wants to know, what's the energy equivalent of a kilogram in joules? So E equals mc squared for that. <clears throat> And then there is a little thing that talks about tritium. Uh, tritium is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. And so number two says, um, if gives the universal mass unit mass of a neutron and a proton and of tritium, and it says how much mass is converted to energy in the production of the tritium. So going with one proton and two neutrons and then going to tritium, there's actually a mass loss. We'll figure that out and then uh, convert that mass to energy. That's E equals mc squared. Um, then number three says, there you go. How much energy is that in mega electron volts, in electron volts, and in joules? Um, then the fourth question deals with um, <clears throat> balancing equations for things like alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay, etc. cetera, um, which you don't really have to do that much in regions physics, but it does touch on conservation rules really well. So I wanted to get into that in number four. Um, the numbers five, six, and seven, oops, numbers five, six, and seven get into uh, the standard model of particle physics um, being uh, the proton, the neutron, and a kaon, which you probably have not heard of, and things like mesons and, uh, um, and baryons and, and antiparticles and all that jazz. So uh, we have our handy dandy reference table here to help us. Um, we have page one of the reference table, then we have page two, and then we have page three and four and five. And page six of the reference table, we probably won't need um, and then let's get started with qu the sample question one. So first of all, um, there's a lot of writing there and the first question actually has very little to do with the writing, but that's a trend now on the regions exam and also as we move forward with the next generation science standards, um, having like reading passages that there's information in there that you may or may not need and then you have to, you have to deal with it. Um, so that that's why it's there. Some people have said all oh, those reading passages are confusing, distracting, or annoying, but that that is the direction we're heading. Um, and uh, so so anyway. Um, but number one, what's the energy equivalent of one kilogram in joules? And so we use the handy dandy E equals m c squared. M is just one; it's one kilogram. C we know is the speed of light in vacuum, which is on page one of the reference tables. But by this point. After having doing waves and light, you should know that. Um, and uh, don't forget to square the C. Um, just the C is squared, not the M. So it's just M times C squared. Um, and you get 9 times 10 to the 16 joules for your energy. And uh, that's a big number. That's That would be 90,000 terajoules. Um, or 9 times 10 to the 3. Um, I'm sorry, 9 times 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 12 joules. It's a tremendous amount of energy. I'm not playing when I talk about the Niagara Falls in 30 weeks. Anyway, so number two talks about, talking about tritium, and we're dealing with the universal mass unit. Well, we deal with that um, because E equals mc squared is handy dandy when you're dealing with uh, joules and kilograms, but most of the time you're on the small scale, uh, like on the order of individual neutrons. Um, and you know from your notes that a universal mass unit is one twelfth of the carbon-12 atom. Um, and it's because carbon-12 is very common, and there are 12 um, nucleons in, in carbon-12, and it's kind of like an average. But anyway, <clears throat> the neutron is not exactly one universal mass unit. That's why the universal mass unit is not defined as mass of a neutron. It's one twelfth of carbon-12. And the reason why is because the proton is slightly different. Um, so tritium has a proton and two neutrons, so let's work that out. 
So yeah, the tritium is a proton and two neutrons. So you got the universal mass unit, mass of the proton and the neutrons from the problem. Um, and so tritium, just in terms of, of its constituent particles, is 3.024606 universal mass units when you add them all together. But the actual mass of tritium is 3.016049 universal mass units. And that difference between them is 0 0.008557U. That, that energy is quote unquote missing where that mass is missing, um, and it got turned into energy by E equals mc squared. Some of that energy binds up the tritium, and the rest is released as is released energy. Now, number three wants to know what, what actually is that in terms of energy? What is that in mega electron volts and electron volts and joules? Now, mega electron volts it seems like a weird thing to ask, but on the front page of the reference table, they give you the conversion from universal mass units to mega electron volts. Here we are, front page of the reference tables, and there it is. One universal mass unit is 931, or 9.31 times 10 to the 2, mega electron volts. All right, so here's a bunch of conversions. One of them is easy peasy, but we have mega electron volts, or sorry, universal mass units to mega electron volts. So how many mega electron volts is 2.008557 universal mass units? If 931 mega electron volts is to one universal mass unit, put X up at the top. Um, X is what we're solving for right here. And then uh, and then you want to keep the units the same. So if mega electron volts are in the numerator, mega electron volts, mega electron volts on the top, universal mass units, universal mass units on the bottom. Cross multiply, solve for X, and you get that. 0.008557 universal mass units is uh, uh, almost 8, 7.967 mega electron volts. Then I want to know how many actual electron volts is that. Well, just remember that mega means a million. So 7.967 mega electron volts is 7.967 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. And if you don't remember that mega means a million, it's on the front page of the reference table. Um, then the reason why I had you convert from mega electron volts to electron volts is because now I want to convert to joules. Um, you could convert from mega electron volts, but it's we know the conversion uh, electron volts and joules. So that's why I had you switch to EVs. And you could say, how many joules is to 7.967 times 10 to the 6 EVs if 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules is to 1 EV? Cross multiply again, and you get 1.232 times 10 to the negative 12 joules um, for that, that conversion. Now, that almost, that's so small, it almost seems like a math mistake, but you have to remember, that's for one tritium. Um, if they're actually doing these processes, you're dealing with, you know, billions and billions and billions of these things happening all at once. Um, and to give you a sense of scale, a 100-watt light bulb, um, that's 100 joules per second, a 100-watt light bulb... Um, I don't know if it draws that. Yeah, it draws that in electricity and it puts it out in as heat and light, but it draws 100 joules every second. So one tritium atom isn't much, but they they come in numbers, and so you actually wind up you do wind up with a lot of energy. Now number four is talking about this process getting back to tritium, but tritium, since it's radioactive, can actually decay into helium, um, a plus one uh, isotope of helium. Um, but in the process, an electron pops out, and an electron neutrino also pops out. Um, and that's not by chance. They have to happen, and there's a reason why. So there are a few conservation rules at play here. The first one is conservation of energy and mass. And you can actually switch back and forth between energy and mass by E equals mc squared, and that frequently happens with these reactions, but you can't create or destroy energy or create or destroy mass. You can convert from one to the other by E equals mc squared, um, but it has to be maintained. So in terms of the masses of the particles and the energy that's produced, that's going to be balanced. Um, but that doesn't really explain the electron and the uh, electron antineutrino. So there's a problem here in that the tritium is neutral, it's electrically neutral, but it yields positive helium. You can't have neutral yielding positive. That violates conservation of charge. Um, you can do that, though, if when you make a positive, you also make a negative of the same amount.
and so the electron is produced to counter that creation of a positive, and so I have neutral yields neutral, and conservation of charge is followed. Um, the electron antineutrino, neutrinos and antineutrinos have no charge, and so that doesn't bring any charge to the table, and conservation of charge is cool. Now there's another conservation rule involved with matter-antimatter. Um, if you make a matter particle, like an electron, um, you have to make an antiparticle to go with it. You can't just be like, oh yeah, I'll just throw a particle out there. Yeah, great. Um, you also have to create antiparticles to go with it. Um, and that happens all the time. In fact, surrounding you right now, there are particles and antiparticles popping into existence and then annihilating each other and going right back to the way they were and you don't even notice it, but it happens all the time. Um, in fact, they think that's how the Big Bang happened where there was in matter antimatter generation, um, but something occurred which caused there to be slightly more matter than antimatter. Um, they're still researching why they think that's true, what happened there, but it was, it was a quirk. Um, and so since slightly more matter was generated in a runaway reaction, it was like, whoop, oh, there you go. Hey, look at that, you have yourself a universe. Um, which I kind of say that jokingly, you know, not to take the universe lightly, but now they're starting to think that our universe is not the only universe that could have possibly ever been generated. Um, and we may actually be one universe, uni meaning one, we may be one in a number of universes or multiverses, as they say. Um, and uh, that is becoming less and less of a fringe theory and more and more of a thing. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But let's bring my tangent back. So that is why the anti, the electron antineutrino is there. It's an antiparticle to counter the regular matter particle being the electron. And you might be tempted to say, well, okay, so particle is the electron. Why isn't the anti-electron created? It's called the positron, the positive version of the uh, electron. But that goes back to conservation of charge. Um, it's not going to make a positive particle um, because that would break conservation of charge. So it's not going to make the positron. Um, it's got to make an antiparticle, but that antiparticle has to be neutral. And so that's, that's how the antineutrino pops out. And it's called the electron antineutrino because it happens to be created with the electron. If that was a different particle, such as the tau, then it would be the tau antineutrino. Just a note, by the way, because I also wanted to use this problem to address um, antimatter. Antimatter has the same mass but the opposite charge sign of its normal matter counterpart. If that's a neutral particle, then the antiparticle is also neutral. So an antineutron is is neutral just like a neutron is neutral but an anti-proton would be negative whereas a proton is positive um, there are some other differences about antimatter but those are the the major ones that the mass is the same but these the charge sign is different they also use this uh, bar they put a bar over the um, the symbol like this for if we're dealing with that uh, neutrino that bar right there means anti so if ever you see that bar over a symbol um, naming a particle, it means anti. And I'm not really sure why they put this here, but it actually says this anti-particle anti bit is on the reference table. It says for every particle, there's a corresponding antiparticle with a charge opposite that of its associated particle. Now you don't see the matter-antimatter thing come up that much on, let's say, a Regents exam concerning conservation rules. Um, but they would definitely hold you to the conservation of charge bit, talking about why is that electron there, and the electron, the negative electron is there to counter the positive charge that was generated in the helium um, since we started with neutral to begin with. If it's neutral on the left, it has to be neutral on the right. If it's pro positive on the left, it has to be positive on the right. Charge has to be conserved. Okay, we were just looking at the bottom of page three. We're going to have to go back there because now we're talking about quarks and their charge and particle types and all that fun stuff. So let's go take a look at that. Okay, so a lot of what you need to know about the standard model of particle physics is straight up on the bottom of page three. So first of all, it says that matter is classified into either hadrons or leptons. And 
you'll see in the notes, but the difference between the two really um, is that they, they all interact through uh, three of the four um, fundamental forces in physics. You have the electromagnetic force, which includes electricity and magnetism, and it holds bonds together, holds most things together. Um, they interact through gravity, um, which is actually the weakest of all the forces. You need a huge amount of mass for gravity to make a difference. Um, but hadrons and leptons do interact through gravity. Um, they interact through the nuclear weak force, which has to do with particle decays and radioactivity. And, um, and it's just know that they both interact with that force. But the hadrons interact through nuclear strong force, but the leptons do not. Um, now what that means, nuclear strong is what holds together the nucleus. So hadrons are going to be found inside of the nucleus, whereas leptons will not be. Um, so we know, already know two things that are in the nucleus, the neutron and the proton, those guys are hadrons. Leptons are outside of the nucleus, and a good example of that is the electron. Speaking of the leptons, speaking of the leptons, we have the electron, which you should already know about. Then you have the cousins of the electron, the muon and the tau. I think they're slightly bigger masses than the electron, but they're all negative one elementary charge. With each of those guys, you have a neutrino, neutrino that comes along with it. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. Um, those guys have very, very small mass and have no charge at all. In fact, uh, neutrinos are streaming through your body right now as we speak, um, going from your head to your toes and not even reacting, just keeping, keep going. They go through the ceiling, they go through the floor, and they are well on their way uh, through the center of the Earth, out through the Indian Ocean, and back into space as if the Earth weren't even there. Um, and uh, which is kind of funky if you think about it. But leptons are fundamental particles. They're not made up of anything else. Um, and all of the leptons we have here are all negative one elementary charge, except for the neutrinos, which are neutral. But it says that right there on the reference table. Now, hadrons are further broken down into baryons and mesons. Um, I like to think of these guys as being uh, big, like baryon big, uh, meson middle and lepton little. So in terms of their sizes, the baryons are the big guys and the mesons are in the middle. Um, and which also makes sense when you see what they're made out of. Baryons are made out of three quarks. So you need three quarks to make a baryon and you need a quark and an anti-quark in order to make a meson. Um, and again, anti-quarks have opposite charge sign from their corresponding particle. So um, just to address what we're looking at right now in terms of the proton and the neutron, both of those guys are composed of three quarks. So if they're three quarks, and they must be baryons. So the, the both of them, both the, the neutron and the proton, are baryons. Um, now the rest of this chart down here actually gets to what the quarks are. Quarks don't exist by themselves in nature for a very long period of time. Um, they're allowed to exist for a very short period of time. Um, it's kind of like we're, we're able to see them when we collide particles. When you smash particles together, if you take, say, two protons and you zip them up to very, very high speeds, like 99% the speed of light, I'm not kidding, more like 99.9% .9 the speed of light, and then smash them together, their bits go flying. Um, and at the contact point where they smash, they have a bunch of sensors that watch for the bits. Those bits are quarks, um, but those quarks, they're only existing by themselves for a super short period of time. It's related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We're not going to go there, but it's a very short period of time um, before all the quote unquote dust settles. And once the dust settles, all of the quarks will have joined up with other quarks in order to settle down to whole numbers of elementary charges. So quarks have to add up to whole numbers of elementary charges, whether it's three quarks in a baryon, or it's a quark and an anti-quark in a meson, it has to add up to whole numbers of elementary charges. So by themselves, we have the up, the charm, and the top. Those are these guys up here, U, C, and T, and they're all plus two thirds elementary charges. Um, the other guys are the down, the strange, and the bottom quarks, and their charges are negative one-third elementary charges. 
Um, but those guys have to form up either as three quarks or as a quark and an antiquark in order to make a particle. That's the rule. Let's go take a look at the proton, the neutron, and number seven, the kaon. Oh, well, we look at that. It's almost as if I wrote this stuff down before I started talking about the reference table. Proton and neutron, there they go. Proton is up, up, down. Neutron is up, down, down. So up is plus two thirds elementary charge. Down is negative one third elementary charge. Plus two thirds, plus two thirds, and negative a third is plus three thirds or plus one. Neutron, um, we have up, down, down, plus two thirds, negative a third, negative a third, that is zero thirds or zero, that's neutral. Um, it is possible, I don't, I, is it a sigma particle or a cascade? I, I forget the name of it, but I think there is a particle that is plus two thirds E, where you have all three of the um, plus two thirds, did I say plus two thirds? Plus two, plus two E all three of the plus two thirds quarks to make plus six out of three, which would be plus two. Um, but that's uncommon. And you, in order to have that, to have negative two thirds, it would have to be the anti-versions of those, anti-up, anti-charm, anti anti-up, anti-charm, anti-top. Um, and that would be negative two thirds, and I'm not even sure that's a real particle. So um, your particles that you're going to see are probably going to be plus one, zero, or negative one. Rarely plus two, and I don't think you're gonna see negative two. And anything plus three, negative three, et cetera, I, no. Um, not on the, unless there's some kind of funky quirk situation that I'm, I don't know about. I, I know there've been recent uh, discoveries involving quarks, but nothing that is making it to the region's physics reference table, I can tell you that. All right, our last problem with our kaon is strange anti-up. And there's our bar again over the up, meaning that it's anti. I have a quark and an anti-quark. That must make this guy not a baryon, but a meson. I just realized that I read this wrong. Um, I wrote strange anti-up, but if it's a positive particle, it can't be strange anti-up. It has to be up anti-strange. All right, let me fix that. All right, let's erase that. That is actually up anti-strange. Up anti-strange. Straight can't spell strange. Strange. Okay, there we go. Up anti-strange. Um, in order to get positive um, because strange anti-up would actually give me negative. Uh, so let's go back to where we were. And this two finger scroll is annoying. Oh, come on. There we go. I should just start a new page. But anyway, um, so we have, let's fix this. And we have up anti strange, which is, is still a meson. Um, but let's see, we have up and we have anti-strange. So strange is negative one-third, but it's anti-strange, so it's positive one-third E. It's not letting me do, here we go, negative one-third E, but it's anti, so it's positive. When you throw that together, you get plus three-thirds E, and that's plus one elementary charge. So that's how we get our plus one from up anti-strange. Um, now let me address what the question actually says. What is the charge of a strange quark in elementary charges? I have that right here, and that's from page three of the reference table. Then it says, what is that in coulombs? Um, I will do that in a sec. 
What type of particle is a kaon? We said that that is a meson because it's a quark and an anti-quark. Um, and it says, what's the charge of a kaon in elementary charges and in coulombs? Here's the charge in elementary charges. And in coulombs, that's easy. Um, we don't need to convert that. That is just simply positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, because we know that an elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Um, but one third of an elementary charge, let's do that math. And there you have it. Right at the bottom of the page, I was able to squeeze it in. Negative a third of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs is negative 5.33 times 10 to the negative 20 coulombs. Um, so that is the charge of the strange quark in coulombs. And um, that, so we have, it's all boxed out. Um, I could probably organize that a little better visually, but my iPad, I don't know if it's my Apple Pencil, I tried a stylus, I don't know, I think my iPad is kind of a bit, kind of on the fritz. Um, I'm done anyway, so I'll just leave you with that. I'm sorry I don't have a picture for you. Um, you can blame my iPad. Thanks, iPad. Uh, all right, bye.